Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This is uh, our Wednesday night video, so we're going to be talking about something that's, well, maybe you'll see it that it's important. Uh, maybe you won't. Uh, a lot of the videos that I do, some people think it's important, some people think it's not. I want to talk about just what our primary purpose is here for Our primary purpose as believers here on earth what is our primary mission and most of you would say well and I'm sure that you would say and probably rightfully so that our primary mission here is to evangelize uh, preach the gospel uh, save as many souls as we can Maybe we're not all evangelists, and maybe, just maybe, that it makes a difference what message we're presenting or proclaiming and what we think the gospel is. There's always the danger that we can actually preach another gospel, but without going into that, and if you follow this channel for any length of time, you know where we stand on that. I want to talk about as far as the believer's life is concerned within the ministry of the body of Christ, what do you think, I'm going to tell you later what I think, which may or may not amount to anything. What is our primary mission, purpose, as far as, far as one another is concerned, in members of the body of Christ? I, I have always believed that the church's primary ministry is to itself, where that it builds up the body, where the body is edified, uh, grown, uh, matured, so that it can then be that effective tool uh, that God uses in accordance with the truth to reach the lost. Because if it's not, if, if the body is not trained up and educated and schooled in the truth of the gospel, then there's always that danger that we can carry the message not only the wrong message, but we can actually build up the body in a way that is not healthy and it does more damage than good. Now, what is my primary miss, m mission as far as you are concerned? Let's just assume that you are a Christian. What is my primary obligation to you? My primary interest, my primary goal, the, my main interest, my, my main... I, I what I want to I'm looking for a word that's kind of hard to hard to come up with here. My main concern for you, you know, if I have any concern for you at all, I mean, and I'm I'm assuming that we as Christians should have concern for one another. So what would that be as far as you are concerned? And of course that would go the other way. It would it would turn back my way. I mean, what is your main concern for me in my life? Is it that I have a big horse ranch? Is it that uh, I'll stay healthy? Is it, is it that uh, I'll have uh, plenty of money for junk food, uh, snacks? Uh, is, it, is it that you know, uh, my marriage will be happy? Is it that, that my grass will grow green? I mean, or, or okay, maybe I'm getting a little off track here, but what is your primary interest in me as far as, as, as a Christian? Just thinking of me as a brother in Christ, not a pastor, just a brother in Christ. What should be your primary concern for me? Well, that I don't have a heart attack, that I don't have a stroke, that I don't get hit by a bus, that I don't get rolled over on a tractor, thrown off of an ATV. What is your major concern? And that's what I want to talk about. That's what I want to talk about. Because and, and in doing so, I want to clarify up front that I'm not making light of all of those other concerns. But I am, I believe, asking a legitimate question, a valid question, something that I think that's, is worth spending some time thinking about. And that is, what is our desire toward one another? Well, you can say, well, it's to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, Steve. And, and that sounds wonderful. And I, I can't disagree. I wouldn't disagree with you one bit. But you could say, well, my primary, our primary responsibility 
toward one another is kind of like my Pentecostal mother's was, which was to grab me by the ear and, and, and make sure that I don't go into doing this or that or that or the other thing, or I stay, you know, I stay out of trouble. I keep my nose clean, you know, you know, you, you know the expression. We judge one another, we look at one another. There's a brother, he's involved in this and I don't think he ought to be and so I'm gonna tell him that he shouldn't be. I'm probably not going to have the ability to tell him how not to be, but I'm gonna tell him not to be and, and, and let's certainly don't bring up those things in my own life that that brother could turn around on me and do the same thing. I have spoken a lot over the past six years on what I believe the gospel is. And I've made a number of videos on the judgment seat of Christ where there's no condemnation, but we stand before God holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His, in his sight, uh, a judgment, uh, the Bema, uh, judgment seat of Christ, which I believe occurs shortly after the rapture. And, uh, and I've mentioned in that passage in 1 Corinthians 3, Somewhere around verse 15, you're looking at a believer who is, whose entire life's work is burned up, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. The word saved, I want to talk a little bit about that word, saved, and I want to talk a little bit about what I believe it means there when it uses the word singular work and a man's entire life's work singular can go up in smoke and yet he himself shall be saved yet so as through fire and I'll try to talk a little bit about the fire. Now I've also mentioned that we are redeemed to be saved. You don't run into, a fireman doesn't run into a burning building and, 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 and drag out a burned up corpse and say, well, I saved the guy. You, we don't save anyone who's dead. We can't save anyone who's dead. And primarily, when, for the most part, what we as Christians often do is we take regeneration, we take sanctification, we take justification, we take glorification. We take all of these words, regeneration, we take and we, we throw them all into one basket and, and that just means saved. That's, that's saved. You know, redeemed means saved. Sanctified means saved. Those terms, all of those terms are concepts, that, branches of theology that are, that are actually included in the word saved. It, it, but I also, I, want, I, I understand, I realize the difficulty when it comes to context and salvation not being synonymous with regeneration. However, I think it's best to keep in mind that dead people cannot be saved. Salvation in Scripture primarily refers to the living, unless it's talking about our regeneration or it's talking about the redemption, the, the salvation of our bodies. Uh, something that's yet future. You know, I'm, I'm trying to look at the middle section of this here. Uh, I want to go over our lifetime and, and look at this from an honest perspective. Those who have first been made alive need saved. And I don't understand, folks, why that is such a difficult concept for Christians to grasp. We, weren't, we certainly weren't saved, and then there's nothing else to follow. We certainly weren't redeemed in order to not be saved. Now, I don't have the time in this video to go over all, the, all these other branches of theology, such as regeneration and and sanctification, and I've touched on many, many of those in, in, in these uh, other videos, but not even physicians uh, save those who are deceased. Now, maybe some try. I personally don't think they've had much success. And neither does God. Neither does God. 
the only the only people that a fireman a fireman will run into a burning building to save are those who are alive. And if they brought anyone out and they're alive, then they have it's correct to say that they saved them. But if he drags out a burnt up victim of a fire, he certainly hasn't saved them. The unregenerated, those who have not been regenerated, uh, well, they, they certainly won't be saved, that is rescued. The word means saved, delivered, rescued. They, they won't be rescued at the rapture. Christ Jesus came to save His people from their sins, wrote Matthew. Uh, God just doesn't save, quote-unquote, spiritually dead people. He doesn't just save spiritually those who are spiritually dead. Man, man doesn't do that. Even something has to occur first, and that is they have to be quickened, they have to be made alive, they have to be regenerated, or as we would we would say, we born again. I believe those two terms are. I don't even think those two terms are synonymous. But redemption and salvation are certainly not synonymous terms. So salvation, then I believe, becomes the present. The primary present uh, issue or need as it concerns you and me right here, right now. Right now. We don't evangelize the saints. The primary need within the body of Christ is to build it, it, the body up, that the body is edified in love through the truth of, of God's Word. That's the primary need purpose for the body of Christ is it, it ministers to one another of course it reaches the lost there are, there are gifts given to evangelists but it does make a difference what God what what we're preaching if we're preaching that man must do something in order to be redeemed then we're preaching another gospel if we're proclaiming the truth of what God has done in Jesus Christ we are preaching the gospel and his sheep will believe his people will believe. So then salvation becomes the primary need. It's my primary concern towards you. It ought to be yours toward me. And context, I've preached a lot on it, context, 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 will always determine the use of the word saved. Anytime you see save, saved, uh, salvation, uh, saving, all of the derivatives of that word sozo in the Greek, it will always, the context will determine how that that word is used. The problem here is many Christians ignore the context. It is vital. Context is vital. The word for Savior is soter in the Greek. The word for salvation is soterion, that's where we get the word soteriology, the study of salvation. And, and, but that's just one branch. That's one, only one branch of, of theology. It is not synonymous, salvation, sozo, save, that salvation is not synonymous with redemption, regeneration, sanctification, glorification, etc., etc. They each have their own definition, but they are included all of these, these things, justification, sanctification, glorification, they're all included in that word salvation. But what we tend to miss, a lot of us as Christians, is those, are those verses throughout the New Testament in which we find the word saved where it is referring to an, an ongoing uh, deliverance from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death in our life. God didn't just redeem us just to set us aside and just say, well, okay, I'll, great, nice knowing you all. I, I'll be great to see you in heaven someday and just, you know, uh, try to get by the best you can till then. Uh, 
one error of a fatal one, I think, of modern Christianity, it just it throws all those terms into one basket called salvation. And so it misses a lot much of what the Holy the message the Holy Spirit intended to convey throughout these passages. Soteriology, it it relates to several other branches of, of theology in, in that it asks questions like who is saved, uh, by whom, uh, from what, and by what means. That it, uh, it, it asks uh, well, as well what the end goal. It asks, it asks what the end goal of the salvation is. And it's related to all these other aspects of theology. We have been saved. We are being saved or we're not being saved. Uh, and we will be saved. I want to go over a few verses with you. One example, Titus 3.5, where the, uh, the word saved is seen in the context of regeneration, I believe. Uh, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and new life through the Holy Spirit. So there you see the word, it's okay, you know. And, and so I'm not trying to be too critical, you know, toward Christians that, who use the words, just throw it around so loosely, but, but I think we throw it around much too loosely. Too, too loosely. Uh, the word salvation, saved, a deliverance, rescue, is always going to be best interpreted in the light of its context. Uh, whereas 1 Timothy 3.16, when we read that, it, uh, it employs the word saved in the sense of an already born-again believer being saved through doctrine. It's not talking about Eternal, becoming born again or you know, receiving eternal life. It's take heed unto thyself, Paul writes to Timothy, and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Paul was obviously already regenerated. Uh, you, you're not going to ever convince me that Paul needed to be regenerated. He needed to be born again there. So uh, the redeemed, uh, that's, that's the, the redeemed. Um, Paul, the, the redeemed that Paul says needed saved. We need saved. I think... I think many Christians think so much on, you know, on, on the issue the, or the problem, and I put that in quotes, of just making it to heaven that they don't think much about salvation in the progressive sense at all. It is, there is a process, a progression of salvation that occurs from in the believer's life. I'm going to suggest before he was ever regenerated, God was already working in his life to save him. Salvation was already ongoing. It didn't, it didn't begin when Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. It, it didn't begin when you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's not when God started working. Like, you know, okay, okay, they did something, now I can start to work. So it's... Paul needed saved, as well as those that heard Paul. And that's you and me. Acts 7.34, I have seen I, I have the affliction of my people, God says, which, which uh, is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning and am come down to save them. All right. So obviously, he's, God is saving His own people. They're already His people. He's not, you, can't, you can't read that verse and, and say that that word saved means that redeemed. God redeemed His people. They're His people. Now He's, he's expressing His desire to save them. Uh, he calls them His people. 2 Corinthians 1, 6, And whether we be afflicted, it is for your, you, the Corinthians, it is your 
it's for your consolation and salvation. So he's talking, he's using the word salvation in regard to already born again believers at Corinth. Habakkuk 3.13, you went forth for the salvation of your people to save your anointed. And I can give a lot of other examples, verses from Scripture that show how that salvation is something that is subsequent to new birth, that, that new regeneration, uh, and I can't say, again, I, can't, I don't think I can say regeneration precedes uh, God's delivering, saving you in your life. I think He started saving you when you were born. He probably maybe he saved you, you know, in, uh, in, in a lot of physical ways, of course, but but even just your mind, your your spirit, uh, your you know, you were His. You were always His, and He was always working in your life to save you. It certainly didn't begin at the at the point of new birth, is what I'm suggesting. Uh, and uh, we were redeemed in order to be saved Man, and many of us redeemed will not be saved in this earthen vessel many Christians today will not be saved if you're a Christian listening to the, this, this video and you truly love the Lord and I, I know most of you do that's, you, know, I, you know great percent uh, high percent do you know, if you profess to know the Lord, I know that there's some affection there. I know your heart is toward the Lord. I, the Lord, I know you you love the Lord, that you know the Lord. And but I've got to ask you a, a simple question: Do you not think that it makes a difference what you preach? Do you not think that it makes a difference? It will make a difference come judgment day where that there's no judgment no condemnation none whatsoever and yet there there is a possibility according to first corinthians chapter 3 that your or mine my entire life's work can be burned up completely and yet we can we will be saved yet so as through fire now you got to see the grace in that. Open your eyes just a little bit, you'll see tremendous grace in that. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as be by fire. Okay? Doesn't mean you're going to hell, doesn't mean that you're not his. It just means that that, that work is, is singular. That's, that is a man's entire life's work because he did not build on the one foundation which was Jesus Christ. And that is what I've been trying to get to from the start of the video right here. Why was his, a man's entire life's work burned up? Why did it go up in smoke? Why does the text say that even though that will happen, it's not a matter of, of well, maybe it will, uh, Maybe it will in your life, maybe it won't. But there, the reality exists that that could happen and why, despite the grace that you, we see there, why did it go up in smoke? Why? And, and how, would we not want to at least give some thought to, to perhaps trying to prevent that from occurring in our own life? You'd think that we would all have that concern. Because he did not build on the one foundation, Jesus Christ. Now, how can I say that? Well, the, the purpose of that refining there is to remove any remaining impurities. Refining with flame is one of the oldest methods of, of refining uh, metals. In this case, the fire is God's righteous judgment. He, God is righteous to remove any remaining impurities of the flesh. Well, okay, Steve. So it just why well, why why does it make what's doesn't matter how we live. I mean, we're going to heaven. Uh, our entire life's work can be burned up. Yet we ourselves will be saved through fire. Let's go fishing.
I think it comes down to how much we love him. I think it comes down to how much we love him and, and how much that he has committed unto us how much we come to realize that he has committed to us one message, one message only, and that is a ministry of reconciliation that God was in Christ doing something. And that he was done. It's an accomplished thing in, in the past. God did it. He's not going to repeat it. That's it. That's the message that we carry. That's the message that we proclaim is what Christ did, not what we do. That's the message we carry. That's the message we proclaim. What Christ did. Christian, I'm talking to you, Christian. We carry the message of what Christ did, not what man must do. That's not the message you were commissioned to carry. You were not given, commissioned, that kind of message. You only have one message, and that is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and what He did. That's it. And His sheep will hear. And, but more than that, that's just the start, folks. Dearly beloved, that is just only the beginning. Our lives continue on, and we're going to be involved in, in some activity, either one activity or the other. One is either going to be the same thing, the same spinoff of that, the same, it's from the same root, it's, it's from the same source. We're either going to be continuing to, to proclaim that, or we're going to continue to proclaim what man must do. Well, well he's saved, or he's, he's born again. We got him, we worked hard, we got him born again, now we got to get him saved. We got to get him delivered. You know, this is not about rules and regulations and laws and com commandments and, and mandates and and you know what ifs and what what not. You know, if if I do something, God will do something. If if God doesn't do do something, uh, then well, maybe certainly I need to try to do something. It's you know, folks. Just as with along with all of the other corruption that you see nightly on your news going around this this world that we live in at the present time, when you see so much corruption, you've got to at least give some thought to the fact that there is that same corruption in the church today. In fact, it's really whereas with America, I can see where America has changed. I don't. I look down through history. I don't see where anything's changed. I mean, sure there have been revivals and there have been uh, revolutions and 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 you know there have been uh, re uh, reformations and, and and you know it's kind of gone up and down, up and down all through history. But folks, the entire epistle of Galatians was written to address the legalistic problem there at Galatia that existed at that time. Nothing's changed. There is nothing new under the sun. The same criticism that Christ received, you ought to receive. And I'm going to suggest if you don't receive that same criticism, then you're probably off living in a closet someplace or or you're just not uh, consciously aware of, of enough background concerning all this that that there's ever any opportunity that it, any opportunity ever arises, you know, for you to experience anything like that. If you're serious about Jesus Christ and your life, your walk, your relationship, your communion with Him and His people, if that's your heart, and I, I have to believe that it's the heart that He gave you. If that's the heart that you have toward God, I think He's going to move heaven and earth to make sure that you understand that there is only one foundation, and that is that foundation, Jesus Christ. We don't, we don't have another foundation other than the one that is laid, and that is Jesus Christ. We preach Jesus Christ and Him cruci crucified. That's what we preach. Uh, we don't want to go the way of Israel, you know, uh, 
As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Romans 9.33 But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because it was not by faith, but as by works. They stumbled over the stone of stumbling, Christ Jesus. Many will stumble over these. They will fall and be broken. They will be uh, ensnared and captured, says Isaiah. He also says, Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. 1 Corinthians 3, For by the grace that God has given me, says Paul, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it, but each one must be careful how he builds, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. This has always been Blessed Hope Forever's primary mission as well as its message. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Join us on Sunday for our study through 2 Corinthians. We're in chapter 6. Until then, thanks for watching.